Good morning again. If you've got your Bibles, good luck is my uh, message today. Uh, we are going to be moving very fast. Uh, as you can see from your, your bulletins uh, there in your outline, we've got some 25 scriptures, passages to get through today, so we are going to be moving quickly. Um, do your best to keep up, and uh, some of you all I saw already did some bookmarking, and that is good, but uh, we're going to have to keep moving today or we will never get through this. So uh, anyway, I put them in your bulletin so you can go back and study them later, hopefully, and uh, meditate on them this week and consider these things because we really are just going to be able to have enough time to just kind of touch uh, each of these points. If you missed our message last Sunday, last week, uh, we, we started part one of this on deception. We've been doing this series called Collision for some time now. And um, this last week and this week, we're talking about the collision between truth and illusion. And um, really just talking about the way that, that uh, the world is filled with deception. So if you missed last week, I would highly encourage you to take some time uh, today or tomorrow or sometime this week to go online. You can watch it or listen to it for free in many different places. Last week, we kind of laid a foundation for what is to come this week. And uh, this week, we're going to have a deeper discussion about the ways in which the devil deceives us. But just to recap very quickly from last week, we said that there are three foundational areas that the devil loves to deceive people. We looked um, at the temptations of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 and saw how the devil even tried to deceive the Son of God in these three ways. And uh, we basically said, if he's not going to leave Jesus alone, he's not going to leave you alone. So uh, we, we want to be aware of them. And so the first one was he wants to deceive us when it comes to the Word of God. We said he also wants to deceive us when it comes to the ways of God. And number three, he wanted to deceive us when it comes to the will of God. Of God. So those are the, the broad areas. Today we're going to capitalize on that foundation and we're going to dive in deeper into some more specific things. We're going to get down on a more personal level for, for us as believers. But before we do that, I want us to very quickly to consider all the different kinds of deception there are in our world. Last week I asked you to raise your hand if you had ever been deceived, and everyone raised their hand, because we've all been deceived at some point in time in our lives. Uh, we also said last week, not only have we been deceived, but at some point in our life, we have been a part of the deception. We've been a part of deceiving someone else, and so we, we know what deception is from both sides of it. But consider just very quickly with me these seven big areas of deception. And we could certainly list, list dozens and dozens more, but uh, these are just some of the seven that I, the seven that I think are the, the, the easiest and the, the biggest and the broadest for us to see. So I'll start with political deception. Probably don't need to say very much about that. Um, we all know that politicians very frequently use deception and manipulation to achieve their goals. Both sides, both parties, all people in politics do that. Amen? And, and, and it, it seems, maybe, maybe I'm just getting old, but it seems to me like it's getting worse. It seems to me like the deception and the manipulation in, in politics every election cycle gets worse and worse and worse. So we have political deception in our world. We also have what I might call or we might call social deception. Um, social deception is when somebody we know or somebody we love, maybe somebody even in our, our family, but certainly somebody we have a relationship with or we socialize with, uses some form of deception against us. And again, last week I asked you to raise your hand if you had ever been deceived and everybody raised their hand. And I would guarantee you that deception probably didn't just come from a politician. So at some point in your life, there has been some deception uh, in your life from somebody you knew, somebody personally that you socialized with or were close to. Number three, I would say there is cultural deception in our world. Again, these are big, broad areas, but um, this, this kind of deception uh, is, is the deception that gets embedded into your culture, or our culture in this case, and, and becomes accepted as truth and normal. For example, in, in our current culture, 
Um, one of the great deceptions that has gone on over the last decade is this deception about gender. That gender is I- irrelevant, that it doesn't matter. You can just, you can identify as whatever you want, right? You can just pick some pronouns and make those yours. In fact, you can just change your gender if you want to. We have people that have gone so far now as to decide they, they don't even want to just identify um, with their gender, but another cultural deception that's happening now is not only can you pick what gender you want to be, but you can pick what you want to be. If you want to, if you want to be a cat, you can be a cat. Like, you can just make up in your head and mind that you're going to be a cat. There are, there are actually, I mean, I've read news articles about this. It's not in our area, but, but it's a growing thing in our culture now that there are workplaces that are providing litter boxes for people that identify as cats, because they don't, cats don't use the bathroom, right? That, that's how crazy this kind of stuff can get in a culture if you let the deception continue and run rampant. Number four, I would talk about technology, te- technological deception, uh, deception with technology. So many things we could talk about here, but, but let's just talk about the big one of our day, uh, artificial intelligence. Currently, AI can replicate the image and the voice of anybody, past or present, with just a small sample and a click of the button, they can indistinguishably for a human ear replicate the voice of somebody who's been dead for a long time. Many, do you know many of the news stories you read on the internet are generated by AI? Completely generated by AI. There's a human usually that goes through them and reads through them and changes a few things, but the story in and of itself is generated by AI. How many of y'all play fantasy sports, fantasy football, baseball, anything like that? Nobody wants to admit it. I know y'all do. Oh, it's not me. But if you've ever done that, have you ever wondered, like, how can they generate all these articles so quickly about every single player in the league? You want, they're doing it with AI. I was talking the other day with uh, John Paul Pageant. It's been a couple of weeks ago now. Uh, he's a, a real estate agent in our area, and we were talking about some real estate stuff. And uh, he was talking about one of the continuing education classes that he had recently been in, and this topic of AI came up. There are actually real estate agents using this technology to completely just write property descriptions, solicit leads through text and chats and even phone calls. You think you're talking to a person, but it's, it's really not a person. Uh, it's really a computer. They, they, can even, they even have AI bots now that can act as transaction agents and transaction coordinators to carry a deal all the way through the closing. I mean, when it comes to technology today, it's easy to see that deception is everywhere. There's some level or form of deception on every device and every screen you look at. We could talk about media deception. That'd be my fifth one here I'd put on the list. Um, and, and this is all media. News media, there's some deception there. Amen? Have you ever watched a commercial that had some kind of deception in it? What about reality TV? That's not reality. It's filled with deception. Talk shows, filled with deception. Even, even sitcoms and things that are funny are, are filled with deception. It's not just TV, it's, it's radio, it's magazines, it's newspapers, it's billboards, it's all forms of media are filled with deception. We can't leave theological deception off the list. This is when people misuse and manipulate and pervert the Word of God for their own demonic purposes. People use theology to manipulate and mislead multitudes of people all the time. And if you don't know the Word of God and the ways of God and the will of God, you can fall into that deception very, very quickly. Number seven, I would put here at the end, self-deception. Might be the most common kind of deception. It's a deception we don't want to admit is there, but it is there. We can deceive ourselves. In fact, we can generally deceive ourselves about just, just about anything. 
right? We can convince ourselves of just about anything, and in the process, we can deceive ourselves. James, in James 1.22, he says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. You see, deception doesn't just come from the outside. It can come from inside of us if we're not careful, if we don't know the Word of God, the ways of God, and the will of God. So I I outline these things, and again, we could go on. There's more we could talk about, but I I think this is sufficient to prove the point that deception is everywhere. Deception surrounds us. You don't go through a day in your life. You, You don't go through an hour in your life. You don't go through a five or ten minute span or block of time in your life when you are not faced with some kind of deception. If you agree with that, say amen. It's everywhere. That, just, that list there just scratches the surface. We are, we are attacked with deception 24-7 in every part of our lives. And as I told you last week, deception is demonic. It comes from your enemy. So if we cannot identify it, and if we don't have the tools to combat it, there is a high likelihood that we will be damaged or destroyed by it. Paul warned, warned us and others, anybody who will read it, he warned us in 1 Timothy that this issue of deception wasn't going to get better as time went on. It's going to get worse. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Now the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. Because that's where deception comes from. It's demonic. Jesus warned us in places like Matthew 24, 24, in saying things like this. He said, For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, the elect. He says, remember, I've told you ahead of time. You have to know this deception is not only here, but it's going to get worse. And this is why I'm telling you it's important that we understand everything we can understand about deception. It doesn't matter what kind of deception it is, It's demonic. That's where its genesis comes from. So again, this week, our big idea is one of warning and one of encouragement. It's the same as last time. The big idea is this. Don't be deceived. And knowing and believing and trusting in the Word of God and the ways of God and the will of God, those three big things are important, and we need to focus on them to combat deception. But there are, there are five specific areas in all my decades in ministry, five specific areas that I see people falling prey to deception in a more personal way. And that's what I want to cover today. That's what I want to scratch. And I bet as we're going through these, you're going to see how the, how the devil has attacked you with this. Each of these could be their own sermon. And so we're not going to have time to fully examine everything here. But, but I want to get them out there and get them on the table so you can see them. You're also going to notice something else about these five things. All five of them specifically deal with believers. People who have been called by God, people who have a personal relationship with Jesus, they've been sealed with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. These these five things we're going to talk about today are the five biggest areas I see the devil attacking the disciples of Jesus in. Those who have been saved by the by the blood of the Lamb, those who have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, if you're here today and you're not saved, if you've never confessed, if you've never repented, if, if you're not a follower of Christ, I'm not saying you don't know who Jesus is, but you have never given your life to Him, I don't want you to lose heart. There's a message here for you today as well. If you'll hang with us till the end, you'll see how this impacts and affects you. So please don't feel like I'm ignoring you as I'm talking about the church and those who've given their lives to Christ and those who are disciples as we're going through here because these areas affect all of us, but, but primarily we're going to focus on how these affect Christians here through the message and then you'll see how it applies to you at the end. So the first thing, the first area that, that Satan wants to deceive you about is your earthly purpose. 
He wants to deceive you about what your purpose is here and now. Church, if you are saved, if, if you have been called into God's kingdom, you have a purpose. See, God doesn't just save us from our sins. He doesn't just save us from the world. He doesn't just save us from hell. He doesn't just save you or me or anyone from something. He saved you for something. God did not just call you or me out of the world. He calls us at the very same time, at the same instance, He calls us out of the world. He calls us into His family, and He calls us into His kingdom. And so we serve a a God of intentionality. We serve a God of purpose, and that means He has a purpose for you because you're a part of His plan. You're a part of His kingdom. You're a part of His family. If you're a part of God's kingdom, then you are a part of his plan. Several times in the book of Psalms, David says things like this. He says, I call, Psalm 57, 2 and 3, I call to the Most High, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He reaches down from heaven and he saves me, challenging the one who tramples me. Salah, God sends his faithful love and truth. Or in Psalm 138, 8, he says, The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Lord, your faithful love endures forever. Do not abandon the work of your hands. Then I love how Luke gives us this account in Acts 13, saying this in verse 36 and 37. He says, For David, after serving God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers and decayed. But the one God raised up did not decay. Now, now, now you might be saying, well, I'm no King David. I I don't really matter. I I can't really have a purpose. I mean, I'm just little old me. Can I just tell you that's exactly what the devil wants you to believe? That's That's the deception. He wants you to believe you have no purpose. But the reality is you do have an earthly purpose. If you are called by God, then you are called to something, to a purpose. Paul said this to the Romans in Romans 8, 28. He says, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. He's a God of purpose. In the book of Ephesians, Paul said this in 2, 8, and 10. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, praise God, It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Sounds like there's a plan there. Sounds like there was a purpose in mind here. You see, the Lord has a purpose for your life. The Lord has a purpose for your marriage. The Lord has a purpose for your family. The Lord has a purpose for your career or your job or the workplace that you're in. The Lord has a purpose for you and the neighborhood that you live. The Lord has a purpose for you when you're sitting there in the bleacher cheering your kids on. The Lord has a purpose for you. Now the devil wants to deceive you about your earthly purpose. He wants you to think you don't have a purpose. He wants you to think you're too little to have any kind of a purpose. He wants you to just go through your whole life just going through the motions, not realizing that God actually has a purpose for you. Don't be deceived. You have a purpose. And that purpose carries eternal ramifications because you're a part of God's plan. Here's the next area, number two. Second place, I see the devil wanting to destroy people in and deceive people in. And that is your extraordinary power. Church, we are not weak. We are not powerless. We are not fragile. If you are saved, there is extraordinary power living inside of you. Divine power. Holy Spirit power. And it's been my experience that most Christians 
are easily deceived into thinking they are powerless. We're not the first people that the devil has deceived in this. We're not the first people he's attempted to deceive in regards to this power. We, we can hear it in many of Paul's letters as he's encouraging the churches. A couple of examples to the Corinthians. Paul said this, 1 Corinthians 2, 3 through 5. Paul says, I came to you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. Paul confessed that in his weakness he went to the Corinthians, that in his fear and trembling he came to the Corinthians. But Paul didn't say he was powerless. Paul said, no, I came with the Spirit's power in my fear and in my weakness and with my trembling. He understood he was not deceived. He understood that there was still great power in his message because he recognized that it was the Spirit's power inside of him that did the work. To the Ephesians Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. He says, Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The power, according to the power that works in us. It's not our power. There's a power inside of us that Paul said, I know is there. He wasn't deceived into thinking it didn't exist or he didn't have possession of it. He said, it's inside of me. It's inside of us. Then at the end of his letter, he gives them this encouragement in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. He says, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and his vast strength. And then he starts talking about the armor of God. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. But he he begins there by talking about God's power, God's strength. He mentions this power that worked within him and that was a part of his ministry to them. To, To the Philippians, Paul mentions it as well. This is one of the most quoted and often used verses in all the New Testament. Philippians chapter 4, 13. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul says he does all things through the power of God. Not his power, not his might, not his wisdom, not his words, not his understanding of the world. He says through the power of God. He was not deceived into thinking that he didn't have any power. He knew, Paul knew he had access to that power. And he encouraged the Colossians as well. In Colossians 1, 10 and 11, he says, So that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. Right? We can talk about purpose here, but we got to keep moving. Look at verse 11. Being strengthened with all power, according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience joyfully. We can keep going, but you get the point. Paul understood that he had power, and we have to understand, church, we have power. Not just a little bit of power, not just kind of sort of power, like we have incredible power in the Spirit of God. I'm talking about unspeakable power, unquenchable power, unquestionable power. I'm talking about unending power from God Himself. Don't be deceived into thinking you're powerless. You have more power than you think you have. There's this third area the devil wants to deceive us in and does oftentimes, and that is in our evangelistic potential. He wants to deceive you into thinking that that your evangelistic potential doesn't exist. Like so many... Christians today feel like they don't have enough power or any power at all. Equally true is that many believers today are unsure that they are able to share God's love and His grace and His mercy in an evangelistic way that's going to matter. 
They believe that they're unable to share God's love and God's redeeming power and God's redeeming message of the gospel with those they love and care deeply about because they've been deceived. They, they think, and we all do, I've, I've thought these things myself at times, like, Lord, how could you use me? Why would you use me? Why would anybody believe me? I, I don't know what to say. What if I say something wrong? What if they ask me a question and I don't know the answer? What if they laugh at me? What if they don't want to be my friends anymore? Whatever it is, the reality is clear that many believers today have been deceived into believing that they don't have the ability to practice biblical evangelism. It was Jesus who said this in Matthew 9, 37. He said, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Church, the issue has never been that there's not enough fruit to be harvested. Since Jesus said these words, the issue has never been the harvest. The issue has been the workers. The issue has always been there are not enough people going into the field to collect the harvest. The issue has always been there are not enough people out there picking the fruit. And I'm fully convinced that part of the problem stems from the previous points we've talked about when it comes to power, for example, or purpose. We believe we don't have a purpose. It's not part of our purpose to do this. We believe we don't have the power. We become convinced that we can't make a difference. But we have to remember what verses like like Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, when he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Your evangelistic potential is not dependent on your power or my power. It's not dependent on the power of this church. It's not dependent on the budget of this church. It's not dependent upon the platform you have or this church has. Did, did you hear what he said? He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses. In other words, being his witness comes from understanding and not being deceived about the power that you have in the Holy Spirit. It's the power of God that does the work. It's the power of God that opens their eyes. It's the power of God that transforms their heart. It's the power of God that gives them the ears to hear. It's God's power that enables us to be His witnesses. And any disciple that desires to produce glory for the Lord is going to have to get in the field and work as a part of the harvest to make more disciples. Jesus said it like this in John 15, 8. We can look at more verses, but... For the sake of time, we'll just share this one. He says, My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. He doesn't say produce one fruit. He doesn't say even produce some fruit. He says produce much fruit. Get into the field. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And I believe a big reason the workers are few is because the devil has deceived people into saying, well, that's the preacher's job, that's the lay pastor's job, that's the elder's job, that's my neighbor's job, that's the evangelist's job. No, that's your job. And if you believe the deception that you have no evangelistic potential, you're not going to go out and even try. You're going to spend your whole life outside of the field that's ripe for the harvest. Imagine for a moment if every single one of us took this serious. Imagine for a moment if every single one of you and me and everybody who will be here at the next service, imagine if we all took this evangelistic potential in our lives seriously. If we didn't let the devil deceive us or convince us differently about the potential we have when, with evangelism. Let me show you real quickly how, how, how broad and vast 
this potential is and this reach could be. I want you to answer one simple question for me. This is not a trick question at all, but it's a raise your hand question because we need to be able to see it. And this is a question just for those who are saved. If you've been saved, if you've been redeemed, if you've confessed and believed, if you know your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, here's the question. Raise your hand if you came to know the Lord as the result of someone else sharing the gospel with you, right? And aren't you glad they did? I want to encourage you, if you just put your hand up, this week, if that person that, that was instrumental or those people that were instrumental in that part of your journey, if they're still alive, I want to encourage you to call them or text them or write them a card or send them an email and just tell them thank you for sharing with you. Tell them what a difference that's made in your life. Be an encouragement to them this week. Because you know what? There was probably a part of them that said, what if, what if they laugh at me? What if they don't believe me? What if they won't be friends with me anymore? And they overcame that because they loved you and they shared the gospel with you. They got in the field and they went to work in the harvest. And you're here. Now, I want you to remember all those hands that just went up all over the room, all those hands in the air. Now, consider all of the evangelistic potential that's in this room right now, that's in our church right now. Imagine if we all got in the field this week. Imagine the multiple thousands of people that would hear the gospel between this Sunday and next Sunday if we just went out and did what God called us to do. If we just let his divine power run through us, and if we just let him do the work he wants to do. Don't be deceived. God can, and God actually desires to use you in the process of changing other people's lives. I promise you, the people you thought about, the person you thought about when you put your hand up, there was some part of them at some point in their life where they probably thought, there's no way God could use little old me. And look how he used them in your life. Tell them thank you, and then use that as an encouragement to yourself to get over whatever fear and level of deception is in your life in that area and be a witness for Christ this week. Number four. Here's the fourth area. Your everlasting peace. If there's one thing I know the devil does not want anyone to have, It's peace. He doesn't care if you have money. He doesn't care if you have a big house. He doesn't care if you have a fast, fancy car. But he does not want you to have peace. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to cause chaos. He wants to create anxiety. He wants to construct all kinds of calamities that aim to disrupt, destroy, discourage, and dislodge your peace. He wants to deceive you in all manner of ways that will ultimately demolish your peace. But we have to remember who our Father is, who God is. Paul told the Romans in Romans 16, 20, he says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Remember who your father is. He is the God of peace. Remember who your father is. He is the light of the world. Remember who your father is. He is the hope of humanity. Remember who he is. The king of kings. The Lord of lords. Remember he is in love with you. Remember he is for you, not against you. Remember he is watching over you. Remember he is in control of all things. Whatever it is that's stealing your peace, God is in control of it. Do not be deceived into thinking you cannot have or you will never have peace. Yes, you can. Psalm 29, 11 says, The Lord gives his people strength, power. We've talked about that. And the Lord blesses his people with peace. Peace. Proverbs 12 brings a mic drop moment in verse 20. 
He says, deceit is in the heart of those who plot evil, but those who promote peace have joy. In John 14, 27, Jesus lays it all down. There's no doubt in these words. There's no maybe in this text. He says this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. He says, don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. Now, Jesus knew that the road was narrow. Jesus knew there would be hardships and difficulties. Jesus knew there would be suffering for those who followed him and became his disciples. But Jesus also knew that those things can't steal true peace. A few chapters later, in John 16, verse 33, it says this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And then Jesus says, I mean, there's a period there, right? So that in me you may have peace. And then his very next sentence says, you will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I've conquered the world. In other words, you can have peace and still suffer. And you can suffer and still have peace. Be courageous, he says. Don't be deceived into thinking peace is impossible. Your enemy wants you to believe you can't have peace. Your enemy wants you to believe God doesn't want you to have peace. Your enemy wants to deceive you into thinking peace is impossible because of your circumstance or your situation. That's what your enemy wants you to believe. You want to know why? Because the devil wants us to be wound up. He wants us to be stirred up. He wants us to be hurried up. He wants us to be mixed up. He wants us to be messed up. He wants us to be all used up. He wants us to be beat up because when we're that, we shut up. That's what he wants. The most dangerous disciples are the ones who know and live in the peace of God. They're the ones who are like Paul and Silas when they slam that prison door shut and have them chained to the wall and they're singing hymns at midnight because the peace of God is in their life. There is nothing you can do to a man or woman of God who is at peace with God. And that's why the devil hates it. He hates it when there is peace in your life. It's why he fights so hard to destroy the peace in your life, the peace in your family, the peace in your mind, the peace in our church. He hates it. And so he tries to deceive us so he can beat us. You've got to know it's coming. You've got to know it's there. You've got to be able to identify that deception. And then you've got to be able to say, I'm not going to be deceived. My Father is a God of peace. And Jesus says, peace I leave with you, peace I give you. It's mine. i just got to take it. Fifth one. Last one. Your eternal position. He wants you to be deceived about your eternal position. The devil wants to deceive you and deceive me when it comes to our eternal position in Christ. I'm convinced that the devil is so dirty and so sorry and so deceiving that what he really loves to do is try to mix everybody up when it comes to our position in Christ. He wants to make the lost feel like they're saved and he wants to make the saved feel like they can never be used because... They're still too lost. He wants everybody to be mixed up on the matter. You cannot be deceived here. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you are a believer, if you have repented, if you have believed, if you have confessed, if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. It doesn't matter how sorry of a scoundrel he or she was before that. It doesn't matter what they did or where they were or who they did it with. He is a new creation. The old has passed away, and he says, and see, the new has come. You can't be confused about that. When God does his work, he does it, and he does it good. He does it all. He finishes the whole thing. The old is gone. The new has come. And there is an eternal transformation that takes place because of the work of the cross and the power of the blood of Jesus. And that changes our position 
not temporarily, not for a little while, not for that day or that week or that month, not for a while we feel all good and gooey on the inside. It changes it forever. Amen. Romans chapter 10 says it like this, starting in verse 10. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. For the Scripture says, everyone who believes on Him will not be put to shame. Since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. Not might be, could be, one day will be will be saved. Y'all, this is not hard. This is not complicated. Do you, you know what the world really needs? All we really need to reach the world with Jesus, all we really need to reach the world with the gospel, you know what we really need right now in the world? All we need is for the church to act like the church. This is not hard stuff. All we need is for disciples of Jesus to act like disciples of Jesus, where they live, where they work, where they worship, where they recreate. All we need is for us to understand what our eternal position is in Christ and then act like it. All we need is for the saved, the saints, to serve like they're saved, like we're supposed to be doing already. All we really have to do is remember who we are and whose we are and then act like it. Don't be deceived. This is not complicated. If you're saved, if you're a part of God's family, if you've been adopted into God's kingdom, then you should be living for God's purpose and you should be acting like it. If you're not saved, if you're not a believer, if you've if, if you've never been forgiven and you know that if you died right now today, you wouldn't go to heaven, then my message and my encouragement for you today is the exact same thing I've been telling the church the whole time. Don't be deceived. The devil wants you to be deceived. He doesn't want you to repent. He doesn't want you to believe because he doesn't want you to be transformed because when you're transformed, that changes your eternal position forever and you're no longer his. Don't be deceived. Jesus said in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. Don't be deceived into to believing what the world is telling you that there's lots of ways to get to heaven that you can do it yourself, that you can do it on your own, that there are many opportunities and many ways. Don't be deceived. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one, not even you, comes to the Father except through me. You've got to believe, you've got to confess, and you've got to repent of your sin, or you will not be saved. Don't be deceived. There is no other truth outside of that. And there is no other way outside of Jesus. The book of Acts, it says there is no other name under heaven by which men or women can be saved. It's impossible. If you've never believed, if you've never confessed, I pray you would take this opportunity today. And you would. I pray that you would put the deception of the devil behind you once and for all and allow God to transform your eternal position. Don't be deceived. Let's pray. If that's you and you need to call on Christ this hour, this is really between you and Him. We don't ask you to come to the front, walk an aisle, raise a hand, stand up identify yourself we God knows who you are you know who you are that's all that really needs to know who you are I'm going to lead you in a prayer no magic words in this prayer just a sincere prayer you just pray this prayer or something like it with all the faith that you have God knows who you are and God knows your heart just say Lord it's me 
I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up, gone astray. And so I ask now by faith that you would save me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would transform me. I ask by faith that you would forgive me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would make me new. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your love and your peace, for your power and your purpose, for putting potential in my life to harvest. I thank you for dying for me. Thank you for saving me. Father, as we close this hour, we are, in one sense, overwhelmed with the amount of deception that surrounds us, that has even infected us. Lord, we are likely, some, many, perhaps all of us on some level, ashamed to admit the way that it has already affected us in days gone by. But Lord, the goal of this message, the goal of your word, the goal of our time inside of it is not to make us tuck our tail between our legs and realize how much we've fallen short, Lord. Really, in truth, Father, the truth of your word tells us that we just got to go out there and do better. Lord, I pray that we will not be deceived this day or tomorrow or in the week to come, or the month to come. Father, we will be aware of the deception. We will be equally aware of the power and the purpose and the priorities of the kingdom and the potential you have inside of us, the position in which you have put us as your children, your heirs to the kingdom. And Father, that we would not be deceived. Lord, help us, change us, challenge us, do whatever work you need to do inside of us. We love you and we thank you and we pray, Lord, that you would move in Jesus' name.